Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 21. Today, we're going to be looking back over the year 2017 and just talking about what we played. We played, I think I counted, how many new to us games did we play? Over 40, over 50, what, 54 games? 54. 54 games in 2017 that we hadn't played before. Or well or obtained and planned to play. We have either played or we currently own them, or both. <laughs> that that's the list. So nearly one a week. That's or no, over one a week. That's that's a lot. Wow. That is, that is impressive. Yeah, I'm currently sitting on the most unplayed games I've ever had in my home, and it's kind of stressful. We have Spirit Island here out on the table that I have I'm... set up and then read half the rules and then stopped and we haven't played it yet. Out of curiosity Mark... of those 54, how many were review copies? Ooh. Uh... be something to count while someone else is talking later in the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll have an answer for us later. Matt, well, I didn't even say he was here. Orion's with us. Hello, you've heard my voice. Yes, that's Orion. You all know him. You also know Matt, who has deserted us in this holiday season and went back to be with some other people who might be his family. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays from the great, wild and wonderful state of West Virginia. Is it really West Virginia, though? It's like the little strip of West Virginia (laughs) that doesn't seem like it should be there. Yeah, it's West Virginia little enough that I don't feel guilty telling people I'm from Pennsylvania. <laughs> you identify with uh, Pittsburgh more than anything in West Virginia. Yeah, I mean... I'm, well, there are no... Uh, what's a city in traffic, West Virginia? Uh, I can't Morgantown even think of one. Tr- Charleston, yeah. Without traffic, I'm an hour from downtown Pittsburgh. I've been to a Penguin game since I've been home. Ooh. Nice. My new Crosby jersey is 1-0, and so... Nice. How yeah. many more Penguins games do you have coming up? Uh, just to? the the one in March in Boston with just you guys. One. Nice. Yeah. Which I don't. I think I've only gone to two Penguin games in a in a single year once before. So this is a good uh, good Penguin year for me. Yeah, hockey tickets are shockingly expensive. Although I... it was half price in Pittsburgh compared to Boston, which I was shocked because I figured people were coming home for the holidays. It would be be expensive, but it was like uh, even with fees, it was less than seventy bucks a ticket. That's that's not for a pro sporting event. I guess that's not awful. Yeah, it was it's a lot like, more in Boston. It, well, it's Third also of football. It's also two big markets: Boston and, and Pittsburgh. In I'm the hockey sure, scene, yeah, yeah, and two teams that have been good recently. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, what's a lame town that hockey Atlanta, in? Nashville? Oh, they don't Atlanta is a, a large anymore. market. That's fair. Atlanta has like every major sport. Yeah. What like, about like Carolina Hurricanes or Yeah, there you go. The I Florida, bet their tickets are really cheap. What is yeah. it? The Florida Panthers? I've what just insulted uh, like three states. <laughs> Who well, else can we insult? To be fair, Arizona. they're all southern states where hockey is more of a transplant sport. Yeah, like they don't even have ice there. No. Although I have Phoenix. been to the Carolinas and I did what enjoy them. Think? Apparently it did snow in Texas this year. Did it? For the first time in who knows it how snowed long. in the it snowed in the um the northwest too. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think Portland got some. Mm. Seattle as well got a couple inches, so they had a white Christmas. We got like what six inches, six about to eight inches Christmas yeah. morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I ran out oh, I... barefoot today to go <laughs> pull the car up in the driveway, which was invigorating, and then lacking in feeling as my feet went entirely numb. So tomorrow I'm driving up uh, near Rochester, New York, and I'll have to drive past Erie. Erie has gotten over 60 inches of snow in the last two days. Isn't that their wow. thing, though? The lake effect? I, I mean, it is, but I mean... Still, five feet of snow in two like, days? That's, that's impressive. A that's a yeah. lot of snow. So we had that a couple years ago. And it was a lot of snow. <laughs> it, it was indeed an impressive amount of snow. All right, I've counted... 13 of these 54 games were review copies, so... One-third, or one-fourth. Yeah. I bought a lot of games this year. Yeah. Too, too many, <laughs> probably. 
but they've, they've at been pretty good. This list, there are there are games that I can't believe we played for the first time in 2017. It's been a long year of of games. Actually, when I was making the list, there were quite a few games that I was very surprised we played like summer of last year first. I don't. Okay. I, I, my sense of time is very weird. Yeah, but I I I counted games that we acquired Christmas last year. So yeah, some true. of them, like Roll for the Galaxy, we, I got it Christmas. We might have played it before the new year. You know, that kind of thing. It's been a good year of board gaming in this apartment. Yeah, the table. Yeah, that's, that's a new to 2017 thing. We got the board game table going. That's my highlight. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, let, we're just going to be talking about the last year. I've got a couple of lists because lists are very fun, including... My top five 2017 games, which isn't as exciting as it sounds because I haven't played that many 2017 games. I think like 15 or so of the games I've played this year were actually 2017 releases. So these are specifically games released in 2017, not well, acquired by okay. you in 2017. I have both ah. because I enjoy making lists. I have my top five games, my top five 2017 games... And then my top five games that I played in 2017 that were not released in 2017. It's a double the list for double the fun. Plus other things. But what have you guys been playing? Matt, what have you been playing back in back in West Virginia? I've been really happy. I managed to get my family to play a handful of games. Um, we just finished Love Letter, which is always fun. Everyone plays that. My family loves Codenames. I played po- Codenames Pictures for the first time with them, and it uh, it went really well. Kind of the abstractness of the uh, the duality of the pictures in Codename Pictures. Uh, I wasn't sure that my my parents would really get on board with that, but um, they both figured out great clues and worked just as well as regular Codenames. So all in all. Pictures is just a nice break from regular code names, which is the better game. You think so? You uh, think Pictures is, is not quite as good? It's not quite as good. Um, I mean, it, it's it's great. I mean, the code name system is awesome, but I think just there's something about the way that concepts connect with the words that I think just makes. I mean, code names is in my top five games, no question, right now. I don't think the same kind of uh, magic kind of gets captured with the pictures, but it it's it's really good. So um, this is the first time I've played that very much. I got my sister to play uh, Dominion Nocturne with me, so that's the first time I've played through through it, and um, I'm pleasantly surprised. Uh, it's it's maybe more fun than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be a little more of a slog like uh, Dark Ages, but honestly, it's kind of my first impressions, although I've, I've played all the cards by now. It's it's a lot of fun if you're familiar with Dominion already. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it to newbie, but uh, it's got all of the, the things I love about Dominion and uh, changes up some things in, in new ways, uh, some new randomness, uh, good or bad, but it, it's new and I think it works. And uh, yeah, yeah, so... Those are the those are probably the highlights. Uh, Wits and wagers we got out for some uh, larger gatherings. Nice. And, I still um, never played uh, that. Yeah, I mean it's it's just a solid trivia game. It's interesting because it has so it has the the two two dynamics. Um, you're trying to get trivia questions as close as possible. So there's numeric answers to trivia questions, and you're trying to to get close but not over but then you you actually place bets with chips on the answers that you think are closest uh so there's a dynamic of like maybe someone else knows it better than me and then there's you know all the wager kind of interesting things do i do i split my bet you can split your bet to two answers or or something it's a good it's it's a good take on the the trivia game so yeah, I, just based on description of the game and reading about it, it seems like kind of the ideally accessible trivia game because you don't have to know the answers necessarily to do well as long as you know who would know the answers. Exactly. And um, I'd like to play with you guys because I think 
the groups I've played with aren't real uh, good at the wagering aspect. But I think it'd be really fun just to play mind games with each other on how we place our bets and stuff like that. Uh, oh, yeah, that would be interesting. Kind of, the, the betting aspect of the game, uh, I think, could be really good. But yeah, I, it's an easy game to play. Um, it definitely is is uh, worth getting to the table in a at a party. Oh, yeah, I, I'd be totally down. I love trivia generally. So yeah, yeah, I'm almost always down for any kind of trivia game. We even have somewhere some random food trivia game that Amber and I got like at our wedding or something, and it's not a good game. It's basically just Trivial Pursuit, but all the questions are related to food, and we've even pulled that out a couple of times and yeah. just <laughs> asked us each other questions because I, I don't know. I love trivia. I think it's really fun. Speaking of wits and wagers, my first thought when you were talking about that, and I, I've heard how the game works, but how I could game the betting system to mislead people, because the last time we <laughs> played Terra, which is another trivia game, I think my answers got more weight than I felt they maybe should have by the rest of the group. <laughs> so I'm planning or oh, yeah, plotting like, how I might quiet. be able to lead people astray. Yeah, quiet Orion on the end of the table, like, oh, his answer is way different. Well, he clearly knows something. <laughs> like, right, can... and then you give that little knowing smirk <laughs> that Amber talked about in the last podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, picking up tips. I'm trying. Okay, you, you've <laughs> got to play. we got to play Wits and Winters when you get back. Now I'm excited for it. Over here, we played, we almost played Spirit Island. We, we played Noir. Yeah, an Automata Noir, which the review of which will either be out by the time you hear this or will be very close to being out. And, oh, I pulled out Harvest, which is a review copy I got from TMG. And oh, yeah. it was surprisingly really fun. I guess not that surprising because TMG is a solid publisher. But, I don't know, it was one of the smaller review copies I had lying around. And I'm like, okay, I just want to learn a new game and cross one off the list and it's a solid little worker placement game about farming and i don't know just solid just good decisions design decisions all around yeah it's like agricola but there are never hard decisions and everything is positive positive. and it finishes in like 30 <laughs> minutes right you have 10 total actions you have 10 actions yeah. oh yeah i think i saw your tweet about that so it's a uh, it's just a quicker experience than than most similar games it's only like Agricola in that it's about farming and, and it's a worker placement game. Yeah. It's a worker placement game and I don't know, there are various powers. You have like, the, the cool thing is you have very unique character powers, which is always a positive. And then you can build buildings that give you passive abilities or end of game bonus points. And then you're just trying to plant and harvest seeds as fast as possible. It's simple. I don't know. It was really, really fun. Other than that, we did some play testing on a unnamed board game in under construction that we were play testing. But anyway, let's continue down this line and talk about the games on the shame list. So what are the people called? The, the, the shame games? I don't know. Games Di that we... Dishonorable have... mentions. Well, no, they're not. They could be great games. I'm sure most of them are, actually. I'm really excited to play them. But games that I have here that I have not yet played. Oh. Penny oh, the shame is points. ours, you're saying. Yeah, our shame. Our shame. Our the, shame. The games okay. are not to blame. The egg entirely. on our face list. The what? The egg on our face list. Sure. Games I still need to play that I have... Oh, it is a horrible list. Anyway, so these are the games that I at least will be playing. So maybe I'll release like an updated top because many of these are 2017 releases. Maybe I'll release an updated top list once I get these played because I think a lot of them are going to be really fun. Anyways, there are 10 of them. And I'm ranking these in order of least wanting to play to most wanting to play. If that makes any sense. Number 10, okay. Pathfinder, the adventure card game, which I got in a math trade at PAX. 
and I've always kind of been interested in playing. It's like a campaign RPG-ish style game, but, you know, just cards. And it's always gotten decent okay. reviews and sounded interesting. The box is enormous, and there's not that many cards. I did open it up, and I sorted all the cards, and then I started reading the rules, and then I just got angry and went and did something else. So it looks interesting, but I'm not enthused about it. Number nine is Exodus Fleet, which I is the second game I got from TMG. And the only reason it's at number nine is because I honestly don't know what it's about at all other than that it's science fiction. So there we go. Exodus Fleet. I bet it's like... Is it like alternate BSG? Except I don't, not? I don't alternate know. Alternate BSG, yeah. It's got spaceships. I think it's a Euro. I don't think it's like a 4X okay. game. I think it's a Euro. All right. But okay. I don't know. It's probably really good. Number eight is Nations, which I got in the Asmodee sale, which I'm very curious to play because I it is Civ games. It's a Civ game, which we all like, but it's also the game that gets most frequently compared to Through the Ages, which is one of our favorite Ooh. games. Hmm. Is so, it, does it have a map? It does not. Okay. And I glanced through the rules, and it actually looks very similar to Through the Ages. Interesting. Cool. So It's a very generic name. I'm not on board with that. Have you seen the cover? It's like progress. Yeah. No, I haven't. Oh, you should look up the cover. It's the most generic cover. It's got like Abraham Lincoln and Marie Curie on the front looking stoic. <laughs> okay. Number seven. Yes, yeah, seven. I know how to count. Is Blood in the Fog, which is one of two games I got from Hollenspiel after a Twitter exchange in which... The owners of that small independent publisher convinced me to try out a couple of their games. So how this worked was I mentioned on Twitter that with all of my love of war games, I've never played a proper hex encounter game. And then they were like, that's fine, but we've got some awesome hex encounter games if you're interested and we're having a sale. And then my self-control was poor. So I asked for recommendations and they recommended like, all of their games to me, but this one sounded interesting. <laughs> uh, so I know apparently it's a hex encounter game. I think it's about some kind of like Nordic civil war. You probably know the event in history and it's supposed to have some kind of unique mechanism or something. That's all I know about it. Fun story. This is, uh, we were in the car when Mark was reading this Twitter and this is when I found out that it is, Hex and counter, not hex encounter. Like, you what? encounter someone on a hex, which blew my mind, because that's how I'd always heard it when Mark had mentioned this category of games. But no, it is a hex components and counter components, which makes it sound more boring. But I'm sure it's still a fun game type. Well, I mean, it's kind of the MO is boring looking games. Fair enough. All right. Number six is The Expanse, which I also got because it happened to go on sale and I had very poor impulse control. But it is Jeff Engelstein's game based on a TV show, but more importantly, based on the mechanisms of Twilight Struggle. So Ooh. I'm very excited. It's four players. I've never seen the TV show, nor have I read the books that it's based on. So it's it's a game based on a TV show that's based on a book, but all, the game's also based on another game. Mechanically. Yes. Wow. Okay. I heard the TV show was good. I watched half of the first episode, but the place I was watching had really bad quality, so I didn't finish. Cool. We've got some exciting stories in this one. All right, number five is Vast the Crystal Caverns. Something Caverns, which I also got a review copy of through a random Twitter exchange. Twitter's been very productive for me. But the publisher was like, hey, we have a couple review copies left of the two new expansions to Vast. And it's always been a game that I've been interested in trying. And they're like, who wants a review copy? And I was like, well, 
it sounds interesting, but I don't have the base game. And they were like, no problem, send me your address. And so I got Vast in three expansions. There was wow. the base game, and then an expansion that brings it up to seven players, I think, or adds like two new roles. And then the other expansion is just miniatures for everything, so everything will have miniatures. And then the, I found is this randomly like a, a like tiny deck of cards expansion sitting on a chair that I didn't remember taking out of the box. All right. Earlier today. So like a is week after like a, opening a, a, it. A, a, All right. Is it a dungeon crawler? It, it says it's asymmetric. It is a dungeon crawler in which every person takes on a different role of the experience. So one person is like the explorer. Another person is like the thief. One person's the dragon, I think. One person is oh. the dungeon itself. So they like form oh, the dungeon. Yeah. And everyone has their own win conditions. Okay. So it's super innovative. I remember and I know about this. it got I'm, I'm really good reviews. Yeah, I'm really excited to play it. That's why it's so high on my list. Number four, the game we have currently set up on the table staring at us, Spirit Island, which... As soon as I heard about this game, I wanted to play it, and then I bought it to fill out the Expanse sale order on Cool Stuff, so I so gave you free shipping. You, you started an order on Cool Stuff to get a the game, game on sale because you had poor impulse control, and then you added on more games. Okay, I bought a game. To okay. What was the there was first a game, game on sale. What was the first game? I think it was like 30 bucks for the Expanse. No, no, no. Which, which one? What do you mean? Oh, the expanse. Okay. The that expanse. Was, that, that was the was game the I wanted triggered. to buy. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. And then that was like 30 bucks. And then I had to get free shipping. You know how it is. You have right. to spend a hundred bucks. Spend 70 more dollars to get. So then I got Spirit Island, sure. uh, which was like 55 bucks. Okay. And then I had a little bit left. So I got the Scythe expansion. <laughs> oh, yeah. That yeah. The wind game is sitting right in front of me. This year, the the story of this year has been Mark saying, I got another cool stuff order and I fit this game in as well. So now we have three more games coming next week. Oh, my P500 shipped. Oh, my other P500 shipped. Oh, my other other P500 shipped. I only have, I think, two more P500 sitting there and I don't think they're going to get fulfilled anytime soon. Right. Oh, wait, no, three. One of them is projected for fourth quarter 2018. Okay. That's the Imperial Twilight. The, oh, yeah. The that new game by the good. people who made Twilight Struggle. And then two others that I don't know if they'll ever get printed. So okay. there might not be more of them. I'm looking at I'm looking at Spirit Island, the board, and I it's just beautiful. love the look of it. It is just beautiful. Just like patchwork with wooden things and plastic things all over it. I, I'm excited. Yeah, yeah. No, as soon as I heard about this game, I wanted it. It's a heavy Euro co-op where you take you you act as spirits trying to repel invaders. It's like it's just a great setup and concept for a game. Way yeah. to like turn like a, a like a common repeated theme in board gaming. You know, to take like a, a completely different take on it. Same thing. Yeah, with there Vast. are so many Those colonialist like... board games. They're... Now we have an anti-colonialist one. All right, number three on the game list of games that I own but have not played yet is a game I was very excited about coming out of PAX Unplugged, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. And that is Hunt for the Ring, the Lord of the Rings hidden movement game about trying to catch hobbits. Yes, I have proposed playing this game at least three times in the last two or three weeks, I think. We should just play like tomorrow. Tomorrow night. And we've always ended up being like just Mark and I up for playing a game. And we're like, well, it'd be more fun with more people because then there'd be multiple Nazguls instead of Orion master controlling all of them or Mark master controlling all the Nazgul. We just got to bite the bullet and do it tomorrow. And by bite the bullet, you mean play a probably amazing game that we're both really excited for. Yes, that's yeah. exactly what I mean. So you're more excited about this game with a higher play count than... I'm two? almost certain it has the Fury of Dracula thing, where there are always four or maybe three uh, Nazgul. And yeah. 
you just split them up if there are not enough players for them all. So okay. it, it's okay. probably perfectly fine with pretty much any player count above two or two or above. Yeah, and it's probably still good. I just think it'd be more fun with more people. Yeah, we'll get to it. Maybe this weekend. Yep. Or tomorrow. Or both. Maybe this maybe this one will be better than Rebellion. I am expecting it to be better than Rebellion, since Rebellion is a good but not great game. You're still bickering with me about Rebellion. It's been like six months, Matt. Well, I mean, it's it's related to the topic at hand. How about this, Matt? I, and you Rebellion never me, so. is not as good as The Last Jedi. Moving on to number two. I, Mark is wrong about that. <laughs> number two. Mark is wrong again about Star Wars. Number two is the other game I got from Holland Spiel, which I heard about on Twitter, I think, and was immediately attracted to it, and it is called 4X. It's not a 4X game, but is a, is a game about foreign exchange currency trading. It is a zero random currency trading what? economics game. I'm so excited. Is anyone else excited to play with me? <laughs> I don't think anyone else could possibly be as excited as you are, but I am excited to see what they have in store. Yeah, no, maybe it'll be too much. This has potential. It does have potential. Anyway. Maybe we'll have to make it more fun by, like, dressing up as different nationalities or something. Or, like, getting in business suits. Yeah, business suits. That, there, there we is. go. Maybe Do we'll we all need, it. like, scotch and cigars or something? There we go. Scotch, Perfect. cigars, business suits. Uh, and, we monocles. Sp- <laughs> and monocles. And monocles. <laughs> How far are we going with this? I don't know. We'll have to figure it out. Anyway, number one game I still need to play is Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, which we're trying to do this weekend, hopefully, maybe? I'm hoping. Uh, I think there is a high likelihood of it happening on Saturday. At at the the very least with four players. We have four committed, right? Yes. Yeah, there we go. I mean, it's the new edition of... One of my, you know, easy top five games of all time. I'm very excited to play it. And we have a couple days to badger two more people to join and play with us. Yeah. What's more fun than badgering people to play Twilight Imperium? Badger, badger, badger. Anyway, those games will not be on my top lists of 2017 because I haven't played them. But I'm willing to bet that at least one of them enters that list when I do get to play them. So there's the caveat for my top list, which we'll get to in a bit. All right, let's talk about our favorite new to us games that we played in 2017, but were not 2017 releases. So I think I'll run down my top five and then you guys can throw in games that I didn't mention. Number five, okay, which we played first at PAX East 2017, that's Robinson Crusoe, which is... You know, a game I'd been wanting to play for a while. It rose up the the BGG ranks. We finally got to play it. We struggled through the rulebook, and it was awesome. It has that cool consequence mechanism where you go out exploring, you draw cards, you eat the mushrooms, and then sometime later you puke your guts out or something because the mushrooms are poisoned. That was a bad example. you felt good for that round of action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. the point is, everything you do in Robinson Crusoe has consequences. It's brutally difficult on some scenarios, we found. The first two seem fairly easy, and then after it, that, the difficulty ramps way up. Yeah. And some of them are probably completely impossible if you get certain layouts and luck early on. But, but even when you're getting slaughtered, it's a fun game. Right. Because, yeah. again, we talked about it's a yeah, co-op definitely. game, and you're doing it together, and you're trying to find the best way out, and even if you lose, you still had a good time doing it. Yeah, because it's a lot of push your luck. You'll have some successes, some yeah. it, it does a good failures. balance of yeah. smacking you down with bad things and cool opportunities to do stuff. Yeah. Number four on my list is Captain Sonar, which we just played... A couple weeks ago, nice. finally after receiving it, and it was just as amazingly fun as I had hoped it would be. 
the team versus team submarine battling game. We got to play it a few times with eight players, yeah, which is Mark's the ideal count. Town for the weekend, so mm-hmm. we had uh, extra bodies, and yeah, it was it yeah, was a blast. That was awesome. Yeah, I, I was surprised. Got my Amber in there to play, so that's the first time we've gotten her over to play uh, board games in a while. Yeah, did, she did loved she, it. She liked it. Yeah, nice. Yeah, oh, it yeah. was it was surprising to me how simple the roles were for Captain Sonar, but also at the same time how difficult they were. Yeah, yeah it was all it, simple I mean, it's things. How the difficulty comes from being forced into a you know a time crunch situation. Right, and you're trying to guess get... how much does the other team know? Yeah. How much danger are we in? Yeah, 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 the different like... priorities and. The, the other thing that, that I found really uh, cool is how different the, the roles were and how different people really succeeded at different jobs. Right. Yeah. The radio yeah, operator, like, is that what the one was? That's the listen to the other team? Right. Yeah. That's probably the hardest role. Right. That's That was very well, difficult to just listen and note what the other team was saying because you're also trying to pay attention to everything else in the game, but you really couldn't because you yeah. had to singularly focus on hearing the commands from uh, the person across the table. And we only played the basic map, which uh, apparently the other maps have like special abilities that you can use or different weird added stuff to them. So I'm excited to get to those. Yeah, I looked through them. They're really interesting. I mean, they get the last couple were really complicated. Or, or or change the game in really big ways. Yeah, yeah, that was a blast. Yeah, number three on my list is a very highly rated game from 2016, and that is Food Chain Magnate, which I fell in love with as soon as we started playing. Because not only is it a low luck, very not heavy in the sense that you have to plan ahead incredibly in a lot of detail right euro in, in game. that sense it's a hard heavy thinky euro game but but it's hilarious it's so funny right because the setting of the town and just the way the marketing works is just absurd and hilarious and the and the the structure your corporate structure and yeah the management yeah. it's just in the art style everything yeah. about it's really funny so it has this strange juxtaposition of humor and really difficult gameplay and even if you fail miserably which in any game of food chain magnate i think at least one person is going to really fail (laughs) even in that situation probably it's fun like the lot when we played a couple weeks ago i ended up with ten dollars oh yeah (laughs) and you won with over a thousand dollars and i still had a blast i crushed it (laughs) you did very well it's it's very unique. It has that weird beginning game that's so important. Your first like three turns are just critically important to your overall strategy and how you're going to do in the game. It right. has it's these branching paths that once someone takes this path, no one else can take it. Yeah. So you have to take it at the same time as someone or just be okay never getting that bonus. Yeah, so it's it's incredibly strategic and you have to plan very much in the long term, but you also have to react a lot to what other people are doing to try to capitalize on ad campaigns and such. Mm-hmm. Really, really fascinating game. Another thing on Food Chain Magnet is we've played that with, I think all of us have played that plus some out of town friends. And I think everyone's liked it for different reasons almost, or even though we've had different experiences you know, Amber liked it because I think she kind of just laughed at how absurd it was. Mm-hmm. You and I like it for how strategic it is, as well as the absurdity. Um, I know Ben likes it, which this is usually a this is more of a heavy game than he would normally go for. Yeah. Uh, your friends liked it, and yeah. you like it, right, Matt? Maybe less than us. Yeah, but... yeah, and I maybe less than you guys, but I, it was still great. I don't have. I didn't connect with one thing in particular. It was just a great game. Yeah, and it, it's such a unique experience. And it's just pleasant to play. Unlike a lot of really brutal, heavy games where you can <laughs> beat down a lot, it's just fun to make your like 
business organization every turn Mm -hmm. and try to get a little bit better in advance, even if you're not doing it as quickly as other people. Right. So if you can convince people to play, this might be a heavy game to try to get different people to play with you because there's kind of something there for other styles of play. Yeah. Yeah. To enjoy. Number two on the list is Here I Stand, which we've only been able to play once, but I am dying to play it again because it was just fascinating. Masterful. Masterful is a good word for it. Yeah. It's in one of our favorite genres, card-driven war games, and all of the different roles were were so unique and interesting. I, I, I don't even know how to formulate my thoughts on it very much, other than I can't wait to dig into it again because i think the design on it is so precise and so interesting from many different angles yeah it was a huge game lots of interesting decisions unique factions different play styles a whole diplomacy facet that we didn't really touch Mm -hmm. um the interplay you feel like you're part of history you feel like you're doing very important you know world changing things right and you i think it does a really good job of portraying the feeling of an advance of like you're trying to push your army in and take this key city to extend your borders or to secure a pass or to you know whatever your strategic objectives the tactical moves you do on the map correspond to those well from a thematic and kind of experience point as well as mechanically. Here's what I think it is. You can have two different factions doing two completely different things. The Ottomans might be focused on just pirating and the Habsburgs maybe are focused on the new world. And both of you are competing against each other in a sense, but you're doing such vastly different things to compete against each other and in that sense, it, that makes the game feel big because you're not always clashing on a direct level. You're not fighting over one scrap of land. It's not like Comet where everyone's up in everyone's business. Everyone is interacting with each other, but on very diplomatic terms. Does that make sense? Like everyone's interacting in a way that feels like they would interact if they were, you know, rulers of different nations that are like a thousand miles away from each other. Yeah. And in your example, the Habsburgs and the Ottomans could be in open war over Vienna, but also pursuing completely separate objectives. Yeah. 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 It, the scale of it is is really cool. I'm tempted to call it like T.I. set in history instead of in futuristic space, but it's also different. I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 very different. And, you know, maybe if I played it one or two more times this past year, it might be at the top of the list. But my number one game is there just because I know I adore it rather than suspecting I'll adore it. But maybe the possibility that it'll fall flat after a couple plays. The one, well, I I love Here I Stand based on one play. And we only got to it with three players instead of the full six. Uh, which was still, you know, a great experience. Yeah. The one kind of limiting factor is that it takes a long time. Uh, we it's played for difficult. 12 hours and it's difficult and it you need six people. So You need exactly six or exactly three people, yeah, basically. So it, in that sense, it's harder to get to the table than I think your number one game. Let mm-hmm. me check. Uh, yes. Yes, because of those factors even though it may from some perspectives be a better designed game maybe oh yeah it has the potential to like hit my you know number one game i mean it has the potential to be my favorite game ever yeah i i think there's that much interesting stuff in there but i need to play it more yeah, that difficulty in getting to table is something i don't think we've talked about it as much but It definitely impacts how much we play certain games and to some degree how much we're able to enjoy them Mm -hmm. because, you know, we've, if we can only get here, I stand out once a year or something, 
we may not rate it as highly in terms of a top 10 or top 50 list compared to some other games that are a little bit easier. But yeah. that will depend on your gaming group and your personal tastes and all of that. Yeah, yeah. I really hope you guys um, do get to play it with Six and, and, and soon. I'm really interested to see how your, your opinions change because um, uh, it was really fun to hear Jeff uh, talk about it who played with you guys mm-hmm. but yeah when i think of like ti and the scope of it uh it's probably a similar length but because it is i guess a, it is a merit trash um, Wait, here i stand in, in the best no no sorry uh, twilight imperium okay and so it is a, it's a it's a giant space opera where the politics and the the, sh- the shiftiness matters. With here I stand, I, it's like halfway between that and Twilight Struggle. Maybe diplomacy I, I, is a better analogy. Like a, okay, yeah. Like like if you took diplomacy with all of the formalized moves and then made every faction completely unique. Well, and if you mix diplomacy with like a coin game, yeah. Something Almost. more along those lines. Right, yeah. right, right, right. And added the card um, card stuff. Right. Sure. Uh, I, I'm just I'm wondering how a game of that magnitude evolves over time. If, if through three or four plays, if you start to see the depth in the same way that you did with Twilight Struggle, or if maybe a game like Twilight Imperium works better on that scale. Uh, it, That's more freeform and random, you mean? Yeah, more freeform, random, and about the the player interactions. I don't know. I think I think sense? here I stand is going to continue to be interesting as we play it more and learn more about it. Yeah, because I felt like in some ways I was making interesting strategic decisions throughout, even though I didn't really know what I was doing in that game. And they were like, the cool thing is like there are aspects of that game. That I didn't even care about in that first play. I didn't care about the religious debates at all. Because my factions didn't care about what religion they were. So not only are you playing the game. You're more importantly playing your faction. And in that sense the game is is interesting each time I think. because, Or it will be interesting each time. Because each faction is so different. I don't know. I, right. I, I can't right. wait to play it more. My number one new-to-me game in 2017 that was not actually a 2017 release was Concordia, which I adore. It's just a really solid Euro game. Mm -hmm. The decisions are interesting from turn one. Like, what you do in turn one is really important. It kind of twists your mind in a new and interesting way because you're trying to simultaneously expand and get cards which give you points, and do the things that help those cards get you points. It's got really interesting resource management stuff where you need to get a particular resource in order to get the buildings that will let you get that particular resource. So it has this weird chicken and egg problem throughout the game, and it makes a really fun puzzle. And I think it's a really attractive looking game with the art and such yeah the best part of it is how yeah i think everything is so intertwined and like mark was getting at you need resources to build more cities but you need those cities to get the resources so you have to then go trade for them or collect them very slowly and then you have to move your explorers into position but you also need to buy cards, which ultimately give you points for doing the things you're trying to do to expand and get resources. So all the systems are so just intertwined and interlooped, and it's just it's a fascinating game to play. It's so yeah, good. yeah, it's gonna be in my collection forever probably because it's it's that interesting of a game. This is a great pick, Mark. I think it's uh, it might be my favorite it if i'd played it more than once it might also be my number one new to me this year that did not come out this year game well um what is your number one then is it robinson um you know i had a hard time picking one i think it might be robinson but if you ask me right now i would say that robinson crusoe isn't in 
an essential game in my collection. Mm -hmm. Concordia was so good. In the, uh, I only played it once. It's the game that I was left most wanting to play again that never got to play again this year. The reasons you gave were, were all true. It's just uh, a, a streamlined experience. It, all the mechanics just fit together beautifully. And I and I like I like the thematic, you know, the the scoring. You have what do you have? Like the six different Roman gods or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and they kind of each score in different areas of civilization. But it it feels unique in the way that it scores. It's simply a game that works. It works it's, really well, and it's it's, and it's interesting and it's unique. Yeah, yeah. So number one, but with high variance on my list. <laughs> Any games for you, Orion, that we that are in this category that you want to highlight? The one you haven't mentioned that I probably most want to play again was Mechs vs. Minions. Oh, um, yeah. Which I barely missed it. at uh, PAX Unplugged uh, last month, and I just <laughs> had a blast playing that. It was so much fun and just hilarious gameplay, the programming aspect, so you're logically building things up over time. The minis are great. I don't know. I just, I really enjoyed it. It's a game that might not age as well as, say, Concordia. Mm -hmm. But I had so much fun playing it, and I want to play it more. Yeah, that one was on the short list for me. It was a little chaotic for it to make the top, top tier, but it was incredibly fun and stupidly overproduced in a good way. In a good way, like... They did not yeah. need to pack 200 miniatures in that box at no, all. But they did. <laughs> but they did, and they kept it at a reasonable price, and that's yeah. an amazing feat. Yeah. Yeah. I will second basically all of Mark's games as well. <laughs> yeah, I think all of you liked all of these games. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, like I said I before, we have, we have similar tastes. Yeah. Since I never played Here I Stand, I would throw 1960 Making of the President in there. That was also one of my um, short list. I really, I really enjoyed it. And that genre of card-driven war games, can I call it that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, that it's in the genre. I, yeah. I'm a little bit less into it. I, uh, I'm still, I still have some trepidation about diving into those games. Part of it because I'm just, they are big games, and you guys figure them out, and then I'm kind of scared about them. 1960 was perfect. I, I thought it was a blast. Definitely easier to pick up. So um, It's certainly the simplest of the ones we played, yeah. Yeah. Evolution Climate is the other game that would probably make my top five. Oh, right, yeah. I thought that that's yep. an interesting game, but not quite top tier. You love the theme a lot yeah. more than I do. It was... Yeah. I don't know how long yeah. it would last in terms of being interesting. It could be better. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I think there's some other expansions that we don't have that might... Expansions might help the... it out if if it gave people the possibility of, of more and better combos. Or, or just more combos. Because it seemed to... Even... I don't know. I played it, what, three times maybe? Three or four times? And even then, I started noticing trends in terms of like the cards you wanted to get together and the combos you could do. Yeah, that yeah. seems fairly obvious. There's kind of a rock paper scissors aspect to it. Of someone goes carnivore and then someone gets a defensive, and then you're trying to keep outguessing each other while accumulating food. Yeah, um, but it was certainly a good yeah, game. It was fun. Yeah, I think I overheard people playing that like three, two or three years ago. And it sounded way more complicated. And then I played it myself, and I was like, oh, this is easy. <laughs> it's it's a really simple game, yeah. 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 The one other one I'll throw yeah. in there yeah. uh, was Venus, which uh, I enjoy quite a bit. That was number six. Okay. I, yeah. I deliberated quite a bit between that and Robinson Crusoe. Okay. Yeah, and I don't remember why I picked Robinson Crusoe. Kind Venus. of similar to yeah. Food Chain Magnet in that. And, and Concordia to some degree in that kind of crunchy, Euro-y vein. Yeah, it's a weird one because you only get 12 actions in the game. Mm -hmm. But you end up doing so much and you yeah. don't know how you did it. <laughs> At the end of the game, you look back and you're like, wow, I built up a lot of wine here. Yeah, there are very interesting limitations in what you can do 
and managing your economy and you can't do everything Mm -hmm. but you still do enough to feel like you had a successful game even though it only lasts 12 actions yeah and it's beautiful the production design and quality on that game which granted we have like the deluxe version whatever the newest printing was called Mm -hmm. it's top notch even like the cardboard is a slightly thicker than most games (laughs) Just feels nice. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the random award categories. Here are the Thoughtful Gamer 2017 Game Award categories. Let's start with most overrated game, and I think you might all agree with me here. The most overrated game that we played in 2017 was Blood Rage. I don't understand why this game is loved by so many people. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I agree. I mean, it, yeah, no, it gets... It, it, we were really excited to play this because of all the love. Yeah, people love it. this game. I think it's in top 10 probably on BGG or at least top 15. Yeah. And granted, uh, it what looks did, what amazing. Did we decide it was... It does. What we decided we it was like... It felt like the game that... Should have preceded oh, Kemet. Oh, that's right. It, yeah, it it feels yeah, like like it, the first draft of what would become Kemet. Like it has yeah, the same kind of feelings, Kemet. but it's way more chaotic, way more variable, way more luck focused, and frustrating in some aspects, and just not quite as interesting to me. I don't think it's a bad game, but I do not understand why people think it's one of the best games ever. Yeah, I mean, it is down to 17. I thought it was like a top 7 game on BGG, so it has definitely gone down a bit from the hype when it was the hottest game out there at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, and think I we think... should take credit for <laughs> Yeah, that was all our doing. All us, yeah. All 17,000 <laughs> votes were influenced by us. Sure. I think people enjoy the theme of Vikings and monsters and kind of... Which, the, granted, is cool. Yeah, and other people definitely like the Take That games more than we do. Mm-hmm. I know you don't love Munchkin, which is insanely, you know, very popular. And that's really kind of what this game is. It's along the lines of Munchkin or Cosmic Encounter mm-hmm. with the simultaneous play card play with really really variable effects i don't know yeah you I definitely guess, build and, more and of I've a heard strategy arguments in made. Ridge. yeah but, it's not quite as it's not it's as not on the level of munchkin. munchkin that's that's mean but the the way of kind of the take that of oh i killed your thing or i you know i got the right card for this situation is kind of it, it has a similar feel i think and i I understand in some ways why people like it more than you do, although I would not rate it It, number 17. It it is really annoying that the Loki losing is winning strategy seems so powerful. And I've had people make the argument of how it can be, um, you know, combated and all that. But I'll agree it can be combated, but it still doesn't. It it doesn't feel good to lose things. And in Blood Rage, you lose things all the time. You're just losing over and over, even if you end up, like, winning the game. Yeah, yeah. And it's not, I mean, this is an awful comparison, but, like, again, Twilight Struggle, where you're feeling like you're constantly losing, <laughs> it's in, like, the best possible way. In this game, it's it's just annoying that you can always get attacked, and, you know, someone just decides they're going to attack you, and that messes up your plans. And... Yeah. It, it's a frustrating game. And I suppose okay. to many people it can be frustrating in a good way, which a lot of games are. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it wasn't that great did, to me. Did you? I think did it's you think fine. About I think it's for this. Mark? What was that? Did you think about innovation for this? this innovation. Category? Well, here's the thing: any Chudik game is not universally praised because there are many people who despise his games, and I feel like I might be in that camp. But innovation yeah. did give a very poor first impression. But it might have been a flute game. In Blood Rage, we played it, I think, three times. And it was three or four times. And it was disappointing each time. So 
that's why I made it my most overrated game. Moving past that to most innovative game is definitely Fog of Love, which, spoiler warning, will be on another top list later on in this podcast, so we can talk about it then. But it's fantastically innovative, and it has the single best tutorial I've ever seen in a board game. For this category, there was no competition. Yes, no competition at all. The game, the cat, we had an episode about impossible themes, and this game. Yeah, we mentioned this in, theme. In a way. And we, then we two weeks never, later, we find this game. I was in ways gonna... that we could not conceive of, this game models romance. Yeah. I was actually going to say, I think at least half, maybe more of our quote unquote impossible themes have been. We found games like within a month or two of that podcast. Oh yeah, we have four X for like for your market my simulation market simulation. Game. We'll see how it does though. Yeah. Next category I arbitrarily created is most overlooked game. This I suppose would be the op- kind of the opposite of most overrated, but the game I want to highlight that very few people know about. I think that I think is a really cool game, and that is Riftwalker, one of the first games I reviewed. As I said in the review, it's should basically only be played with two players. But as a two-player quick little card game, it's really fun. I I played it again just a couple of weeks ago, and it was still tremendously fun. And I, like, stumbled upon a strategy and a combo that I hadn't even seen before. There's there's all kinds of little strategic surprises in that deck. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. This was a blast. I mean, this was a very uh, innovative game. Felt different than anything I'd ever played. Yeah, with that like shared grid of elements that you're trying to manipulate. It's really cool. Yeah, the part how you're... One of the resources you're kind of fighting over is the physical manipulation of this space. And then you flipping the right elements or subbing in the right elements and then using them to score points was different from probably any other game we've had. Yeah, so if you're looking... If you like card games and you're looking for a good kind of shortish, you know, maybe 30, 40 minute game. Riftwalker is highly recommended. Next on our random categories is the game that I've played incorrectly the most times. And I mention this because we have never played it correctly. And that is Time of Crisis, which we need to play correctly so I can get a good estimation of the game. What did we do wrong the last time? The last time we played, we didn't decrease Rome's influence value when we destroyed neutral territories which made the battle over rome nothing in the game which made it feel very weird Mm -hmm. we got to play that game correctly yes because it has a lot of potential but yeah i think it's definitely better at more than two at three or four yes it feels a lot better absolutely players it's a knife fight in a phone booth and it just it doesn't feel as good or as interesting yeah yeah but really interesting game that I need to play correctly. All right, next on the list, we already talked about overrated. The next in the mean categories is worst game of 2017 for us. All together now, Outpost Siberia. Siberia. (laughs) Which I've discovered had a rules update, a rules update that changed the rules that made it possible to win the game. Probably. Well, it decreased the difficulty by like, 30% Thirty percent. Yes, and gave you starting resources. Did you hear about this, Matt? No, um, no. I so the last I knew is we were guessing that they rushed it to the print without actually playtesting it. That's what we thought, but I heard a rumor from someone online that they actually just like forgot part of the setup rules in the rulebook. Uh, so they released oh, no. they released a supplemental document on Board Game Geek that's like, here's some tips on how to play the game better, which is all stuff we were trying to do anyway. And also, here's some, you know, tucked at the bottom of the document is you should do these things differently on setup. And like Orion said, like mathematically made the game 30% easier or somewhere like around there. Um, which I think is probably how the game was designed. Unfortunately, I've I've given the way, the game away, so I can't test it personally. But it's probably a playable game at that point, rather than being almost mathematically impossible, 
or perhaps mathematically yeah, impossible a, to win as a co-op game at fewer than six players. Yeah, it was, that's it was really disappointing. A shame. Yeah, but it, it, to be fair, though, if it was easier, it was decent. It was it was not... It was fine. It wasn't any more than that. Yeah. It was draw a card, play a card, co-op, try to fight some monsters. Yeah. It was fine. But yeah, with the I rules... Mean, with the rules I was given, it was very bad. Yeah. Moving more along those lines is the next award category I'm titling Game That Dropped the Hype the Fastest, which was Near and Far, which I was completely hyped about. And I had a lot of fun with the game, and then all of a sudden I just didn't want to play it anymore. Like, I'm still interested in going back to the game, yeah. but not really. <laughs> Yeah, this game, you yeah, were um, did you so... ever finish the campaign? No, uh, Ben and I never finished it. I want to, but yeah. not as much as I want to play all these other games that we haven't played. Or yeah. your top five from the 2017. Top five. Yes, Ooh. yeah, that too. But on Near and Far, you were so excited about it, and you were like foreshadowing forcing us all to play the campaign as soon as it came and you wanted to podcast about it and you wanted to play it a ton and you just you thought it was going to be the best game of 2017 i it was the game i was most excited about in 2017 because i thought it had so much potential and i think it's a good game yeah it's just not that good not you know i emphasize that sentence wrong it's not and we kept the we kept the hype through a few plays. Like it was really fun for a few plays. For me, just there were things about it that three games in, I realized I just didn't like certain mechanisms at all, and I, 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 I completely turned around and realized that I hated the semi legacy element that was added. The first couple of games, like I was so pumped for all all those things, and um, definitely dropped it. Well, the thing that like you got mad at the story elements. I l- still enjoy the story elements. I think it was d- done well, well, a little was, bit better. It the in it was the impact of the story elements on the decisions that I had to made make, and that it ended up pushing me in a certain way that really meant I couldn't win. Right. Yeah. And honestly, I think based on the first couple games of the normal full campaign, I think the story elements were done a bit better there than in the character campaign. But I think the game doesn't seem as interesting to me because the strategy seems fairly obvious, which is rushing to the story spots on the map as fast as possible because those are going to get you the better rewards. I think I only played twice and decided I just wasn't interested anymore. I guess a couple games faster than you guys. And the story points just seemed... The the rewards you got for going there were so much better than anything else you could do. Yeah. And I don't... I just... It just wasn't that interesting to me. Just the gameplay. It was fine, but above and below nails this kind of whimsy just go exploring and get some resources and maybe you get points maybe you don't Mm -hmm. and above and below added more stuff to do and it kind of broke the whimsy the magic of above and below i think yeah i i think above and below is at this point i'm willing to say it's definitely the better game between the two it's more it's certainly more coherent i think Maybe Near and Far is almost trying to do too many things, or it's yeah. trying to put these different game types together in a single box, and it doesn't quite nail it. Yeah, that's probably a fair assessment. I will get back to it, and I will actually release a review, but there are other games I want to play a lot more. <laughs> All right, moving on to the most perfectly fine game, and that is the game that I played this year, and I've only played it once, to be fair, that I was like, eh, that was fine. And that game is Photosynthesis, which I think, Matt, you liked more than me. Uh, well, I only played it that one time. I think I thought it has more potential than you. And also, I was, wasn't annoyed scoring nearly as much as you were. I think that, that really put you off. 
What was I annoyed um, with? Was it the scale of the numbers? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think they could have done the scoring better, but I see why they did it the way that they they did it. Basically, when you score, the points start at like twelve, and they go from like twelve to twenty four or something oh, like that's that. That's right. Rather than starting at one, yeah, that um, drives me nuts. Mark had yeah, a huge complaint I, about I, this the other night in a. Uh, the game we play tested. Oh yeah, the play test game. You're like, why aren't all the numbers just cut in half? They could have been cut in half. <laughs> Some of them were odd. You just round at that point because they were all small. All the big numbers were actually even numbers. So I think they they designed it at a certain number threshold and then just doubled it. And I don't get it. It's like a basic rule of design that you make your numbers as small as you can. So, in almost yeah, all situations, that means anyway, I, the I, lowest number of like things should be one. There's no difference between a scoring chart that goes from 12 to 24 compared to one that goes from 1 to 12. Or, you know, I don't think that's exact. Maybe 0 to 12. But it, it drives me insane. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't know why people do it. Anyway, besides that, so photosynthesis I, was all right. First of all, we need to play it with three or four people. To... The problem is I don't think it'll be better with three or four because it's just going to be more chaotic. So the whole thing about like trying to read the board position and plan ahead based on which way the sun moves is just going to be a complete yeah. mess, and I won't want to calculate it. Or I'll sit there for minutes trying to calculate it, and it won't be as fun. Yeah, I'd like to try it with three. I think it might work with three, but yeah, I I see why you put it here. Yeah. You should play with Amber, and she'll just do what feels right and beat you, and you'll be annoyed. I mean, honestly, that's what I was doing in, in, in the first time I played it, because it was just too much to calculate okay. except at certain points where i calculate i know right? nothing about this game other than what you just said so it's a perspective game so it, you you want t your trees to like overshadow the other trees but the whole point is that the sun moves around the hexagon every turn okay. so in the end it kind of all i think it's out. a really cool concept i mean i give it credit for that whether or not it works works out and is like a, a an awesome strategic game it is Beautiful game, perfectly themed, and it is, it's a neat concept. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd play it again, but I'm not excited about it. Yeah. Second to last category is the game of the year 2017 that even my mom wanted for Christmas, and it's what I got her for Christmas, and that is Seikatsu, a charmingly pleasant little tile laying game that plays in like 15 to 20 minutes that. I really adored like it, it it's super light which I'm not usually down for but beautiful well constructed interesting decisions has a weird similar to photosynthesis perspective based scoring thing based on a hex a hexagon and it was super fun have either of you played this other than am I the only one here who's played this one I um Matt yeah played. I played it with you twice it's yeah. it's really good yeah yeah I have not played, so I need to. But yeah, we should pull that out at some point. Yeah, it's it is a beautiful kind of simple, but yeah, I guess it's a decent level of strategy. I think it's a very pleasant game. Yeah, it, it, it's the level where you're thinking every turn, every decision you have to think about. You just don't have to think about it a lot. It, it's almost like you know, if you were trying to introduce someone to a tile laying game, and you thought Carcassonne would be a little too much. This is the ideal game to to give to them. Anyone can learn it. It's incredibly simple. And it has those kind of cool, you know, geography-based tile lane decisions. Final category for 2017 is the game that Gloomhaven murdered because I, for a while, forgot that we were even playing it. And that's Pandemic Legacy Season 2, which we just stopped playing when Glo Gloomhaven arrived. <laughs> <laughs> and there's at least two reasons for that. One is that Gloomhaven is fantastic and we just wanted to keep playing it. And number two is we just didn't put Gloomhaven away because it's massive and a pain to put away. Yes, that's <laughs> also. Well, and also we 
had just lost two games in a row on Pandemic Legacy, and it felt awful. That too. I didn't want to lose yes. a third game in a row. <laughs> we'll finish it eventually, yeah. but if I'm going to be playing a campaign, it's going to be Gloomhaven for the foreseeable future, I think. Judged yes. on Purely judged on like a single game play, Gloomhaven is just a better game. Oh, yeah. It's just more and fun. Yeah. <laughs> Bottom line, it's, it is it more is fun. It's so fun. It's got everything we want in, in, a, in a dungeon crawler. And well, and the reason it murders Pandemic combat. Legacy is not because they're similar, but because they're both legacy games. And particularly with Pandemic, you, we need to get the same four people together to play it. But those are the same four people we're kind of playing Gloomhaven together with. So we will choose Gloomhaven every time. <laughs> In my in my opinion, Gloomhaven also murdered Descent and probably Star Wars Imperial Assault because I would always rather play Gloomhaven. <laughs> I don't know about that. I than, I'm uh, still interested in playing Imperial yeah? Assault. Okay, I was gonna say I at, when I saw when I first opened the spreadsheet, the category with the answers to these was off the screen, and so my first guess for that was actually Imperial Assault, and then I went back and forth between that and uh, PL2. Yeah. I'm still interested in playing Imperial Assault. Gloomhaven is... Gloomhaven kills Pandemic Legacy because when we have me, you know, us three and Ben together and we want to play a campaign game, it's going to be Gloomhaven. Imperial Assault, like, you and I were in the middle of a campaign there. I'd totally be down for jumping back into that. They're both dungeon crawlers, kind of, but they're so different. One's a dice chucker. The other one's a lot more strategic. The tone is different. <laughs> the theme is different. The theme is a lot different. Star Wars is just fun. I, I think I'll definitely go back to Imperial Assault. I don't know about Descent. Well, we said this with Imperial, I guess Imperial, Imperial Assault. I guess Imperial Assault killed Descent, killed Descent, right? Well, because they're pretty much the same game. Imperial Assault just tweaks a couple rules that makes it like 50% better. Yeah, right. Strategically. Yeah. So there's more to be said for Imperial Assault. And I actually, I considered getting expansions for Imperial Assault. And then we started playing Gloomhaven and I was like, oh, wow, we're probably just going to play Gloomhaven for the rest of time because the campaign <laughs> is like 90 scenarios or something. Something like that. But I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I predict we'll finish, we'll finish Gloomhaven before 2019. <laughs> no, I think we'll oh, get. Okay. Th I think we'll the get year. through the game in the okay. next year. Okay, that's my prediction. We, we did what ten scenarios in. So the we've done more weeks? than ten percent of it already in what a month. Yeah, and you choose this or that at least. Yeah, I don't think times, you end so. up playing all the scenarios. You probably don't do more than sixty percent of them. Yeah, sixty seventy percent maybe. So yeah. yeah. Anyway, those are the arbitrary. For that to come true, I think you need a better system for putting it away and getting it back out quickly. I'm really close to buying a broken token insert. The problem is like 60 bucks. <laughs> or maybe I'll get into foam core. I don't know. I, I do need a better system. It's it's a massive game. Anyway, those are the arbitrary categories I came up with to award games or not award them, disaward them. There are a few negative categories in there. Anyway, those are notable games of 2017 that we have played. To take a break from talking about games, I wanted to talk, look back over the last year for The Thoughtful Gamer. I started The Thoughtful Gamer in March of this year, so we've been around for almost a year. And I wanted to look back at some of the most exciting stuff that happened. I think PAX Unplugged was really exciting, and I'm still working on getting stuff out for that. Yeah, you had a bunch of interviews and audio recorded and video uh, that you mm -hmm. uh, recorded for that. Yep, that'll be out. Very soon, I've got like one and a half done already. I just got to work on YouTube stuff. Nice. This podcast. Did you ever finish which... the uh, Twilight Imperium recap views? No, I'm oh, working. I'm working on, on that after the PAX thing. That's oh, okay. that'll be coming okay. up. Okay. Uh, but but I mean, even this podcast wasn't part of the original plan for the Thoughtful Gamer. I just thought. One day, you know, eh, it'd be interesting to try out a podcast and maybe I'll do some streaming. So I bought a microphone and then we podcasted after PAX East, which was episode number one. And I love it. Like, it's my favorite part 
I, I I love you know writing reviews and everything, but I think I like doing the podcast most of, of more than anything else in terms of thoughtful gamer content. Wow. I don't know if it's because I like hey. the sound of my own voice or or what, but I I, I really I think enjoy it's the because podcast. you like the sound of my voice, right? It's it's certainly not that because you <laughs> require the most editing of the three of us in the editing table. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. <laughs> Does that mean the sound of his voice is the best when you're done with it? It is the most improved. Ah, okay. There we go. Whatever that's worth. You edit my voice down so that it doesn't overshadow in greatness your voice. (laughs) I do subtly increase the bass of everyone's voices of the entire recording. I found a how-to guide online to make us sound more awesome. Nice. Secrets behind the podcast. But no, when I was looking back over, like, what I was most proud of in terms of thoughtful gamer stuff over the last year, most of it were was podcasts. And I also reached out earlier today on, on social media and to see if anyone else uh, had any articles or podcasts or anything that I did that stood out to them. And most of the feedback was podcasts. So I think... Yeah, that's exciting to me because I do enjoy the podcast a lot. Uh, Some of the things that people mentioned were Netrunner Week. People like that a lot. And uh, I still get hits to the Netrunner articles every single day. I don't know if it's because they bumped up on on the search engine or, you know, search engine optimization stuff. But people are still reading the Netrunner articles, even though most of them are kind of out of date given the new core set. Right. They're kind of out of date. Some of the theory still applies. Yeah. And... We're still really excited about Netrunner in that podcast and your article. You gush about it, so that part is probably still interesting and evergreen yeah, yeah. to some degree. But some of the specific cards have either rotated out or are no longer in the meta. Right, right. Another article that is super popular in terms of just longevity is my Castles of Burgundy strategy article which is one of the articles that consistently gets hits every day. And on days where I don't have anything new, it's usually the most viewed article. I think over Hmm. time, that one has been viewed the most of any of of the articles. Uh, So that's encouraging. You know, if I do write strategy articles, I want them to be really good. So I don't write many of them because I don't, I'm not that good at that many games, but I think they, I think people have enjoyed the strategy articles the board game table, constructing that and playing on that has been a highlight of 2017 for sure. Yeah, that was a great project. Yeah, yeah. The uh, best 4th of July weekend slash following week that I've had in some years. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really fun. And we got a sweet table off And out we of use it. it all the time. Yeah. All the time. The cup holders are the table has been beautiful. Fantastic. <laughs> we haven't spilled on any games right. on this it's table. incredible. Unlike on a normal table, <laughs> where some people who will go unnamed perhaps spilled beer all over Orion's copy of Descent. And then the podcasts that I got feedback on were Amber's episode just two weeks ago, mm-hmm. talking about manipulation, has had tons of positive feedback, even though I think Amber doesn't still yeah. believe that people liked it. She's still nervous that people are going to hate it <laughs> or think she's like a horrible person. But I think people really, really enjoyed that episode, and I'm glad. Well, if nothing else, it's a different I thought... perspective from our weird nerd view of everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I thought it was really insightful. I think I always have fun listening to the ones that I'm not involved with. With Amber, I think the things that she thinks about are... Well, I, I, think, they're, I think they're a huge part of, of gaming... But I think there are things that maybe we or just in general nerds have a harder time thinking about or or being aware of, right? Mm-hmm. And I think there are different uh, different archetypes. And I don't, the, the easiest one for me to me to to just kind of say is I think of Orion as kind of like the strategic the quiet strategic mastermind that just wants to look at the table and brood and then make a decision and then, you know, plan out some grand strategy. Right. 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 And Um, then Amper's just the opposite of that. Exactly. Yeah. And, 
as, as you know, as archetypes, I think that those are both really fascinating. I think everyone is a mix of them, mm-hmm. but Amber can can put those things into words in a way that Orion's not going to, and I'm not going to. Right. <laughs> that was a great addition to the the thoughtful gamer. Yeah, and even now, so Amber just heard us talking about her and has come in looking at me with much concern because I think she still doesn't believe that her podcast was very well received, but it was. I had people commenting, Amber, on social media about your podcast and said they really liked it. Uh, The other ones that were mentioned uh, was the interview with Michael from Meeple Like Us, which I think personally was my favorite podcast to do uh, of any of them because that that discussion was just so much fun and it was really cool to talk with someone who has a, a different perspective on the hobby because he's focusing on this kind of academic topic of, of accessibility within games. And he's, you know, studied this first in video games and now with board games. And so it was, it was, it was just a fun discussion to have. And I think people enjoyed that one. And then the one podcast that I think, and this is an old one that people still bring up to me on social media in, you know, in comments and such is, our Rebellion versus War of the Ring podcast. I think if any of them was the <laughs> notable podcast of 2017, I think it's that one. That's the one I've gotten the most feedback about, and people loved it. So it's definitely a goal in the coming year to make more game versus game battle podcasts, because I think people like it. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's the one of the ones that stands out to me as particularly good that we've done over the last, you know, nine months. And also possibly the one we prepared for the most (laughs) well yeah we prepared it in that we discussed it a lot before did we have a lot written down on that one i don't know if we had a clear outline but you had you had specific things you wanted to compare and contrast and we had two specific games that are in the same general category so there was a lot of good parallels and ways to talk about them and they're both games that we like and themes that we like. And we'd played them enough to have a good, really, really good, in-depth, multifaceted conversation on them. And, and they're came, popular games. And they're popular games. Yeah. And I think all of that came across in a good podcast. I th- yeah, all that fell, fell I think, together. I think that one and the Mage Knight episode, which is kind of in the same vein, yeah, are the only another two one. where... I made sure to play the games a lot in the in the week or so leading up to it. So I think um, what you guys are saying is that preparation helps. I think preparation <laughs> helps, and I think specific games and specific disagreements that you want to bring out and talk through generally make for a good conversation. Well, yeah, those two in particular, we had... You know, we had built-in disagreements that we knew coming in. Somewhat intentionally. (laughs) Somewhat intentionally. Then that's why we highlighted them as good topics. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's kind of a problem is that we agree on so much that we need to find other points of disagreement, I suppose. Well, what we need to do is just do more in-depth looks at games. So, like, I think Spirit Island could be a contender for kind of in-depth podcasts. Gloomhaven at some point, if once we get further into it. I don't know. Some of these bigger, heavier games, I think really lend themselves to kind of those deep digs into into their mechanisms and make for good discussions. I think the card driven war game yeah. was also one was also similar. Uh, yeah, that was similar. a good one. Yeah. In terms of reviews, you know, I mean, those... I think honestly, you know, sometimes I write a review and I'm like, "Oh, I, you know, I really got across what I wanted to get across." Sometimes I write it and I'm like, "Well, it's written down." You know, that's how it goes. I was trying to think what is the review that I think was my favorite that I think I got across what I wanted to get across the most. And I think it's my Mage Knight review. I think that's the review I'm most proud of writing. Yeah. I don't know. Matt, you said you like my you downforce definitely, review. Yeah. Part of that is recency bias, I suppose. But I think I just, uh, yeah, I thought it captured kind of the joy of playing it, which I think is... Uh, you know, for the games that that you really like, I think that that's I think that's something that you do well. I, and I think it's a byproduct of really digging into 
to a game, you know, not not just doing a simple here's how you play, here's my score. Right. I think by digging into it, you're able to kind of share the the joyful experience of why a game uh, is great, in your opinion. Yeah, that's... I just really enjoyed the Downforce review. Is it, hmm. you know, it's not that complicated of a game, but uh, but it, it was quality. You definitely got that across in your Mage Knight review, even though I clearly am, I don't have the same level of uh, enjoyment of that game. The the the, the review was, was was great. Yeah, that was a fun one. The hardest reviews, honestly, are the games that I'm like, yeah, they're fine, or it was kind of mediocre, or it's pretty good. Those are the hardest ones to write by far. It's a lot easier to yeah. gush about a game or rip it. Yeah, because you just have more to talk about. You have more in- emotional involvement mm-hmm. rather than... Well, it, it's hard to explain why something is pretty good. <laughs> it is. It's really no, I, hard to, to I, pinpoint I, 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 something in a game and said, well, they did that all right and it was enjoyable. Like, you could just say that, but then you're not saying much. And so it's hard for me to kind of break those things apart. And every time I want to write, you know, and they did this part pretty well, I have to to stop myself. I'm like, okay, in what ways was it good? In what ways was it not good? And I have to kind of break it apart into pros and cons and then try to fashion something coherent out of that. That's the hard part. I'm, one of my big goals is getting better at writing those kinds of reviews because I think my negative reviews and my po- my really positive <laughs> reviews, I think I do a decent job, but it's the ones in the middle that I need to work on mm-hmm. to make interesting because it, you know, sometimes I'm just writing a review and I'm like, oh, I'm at, you know, I got up to a thousand words and I'm like, man, I'm really bored writing this. It's probably really boring to read, and then I have to go back and yeah. try to inject something interesting in there. But I'm working on it. Any other notable memories from the last year with board gaming and or the the podcast or the thoughtful gamer? Man, it, like like we we've said it a couple of times, it's amazing how much happened in 2017. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the very fact that it that it didn't get started till March. I mean, the PAX East was uh, was an awesome experience, and it seems um, like such a long time ago. Yeah. For sure. Such a long time ago. I think that's the first time that I felt like I, that was kind of the next level of we're serious about board games. I mean, Mark, I think you, you've been a you're you've been on that level for longer than I have. But you know, there's a difference of being like serious in the hobby and like there's a next step of like kind of being intentional of not only playing games but also about thinking about games and trying new games in kind of a I, I don't know. The, the, can you put into better words what, well, I'm, what I was, I'm getting at? I was going to say, like, there are different ways to go about it. And so a lot of people go about it. They get into the hobby from a collection standpoint where they love learning new games. They love collecting games. They like getting all the promos. They like getting all the expansions. They like having that variety. And, and they like keeping up in the world of board games, all the new stuff. There's people who really get invested in a particular genre of games. So maybe they really love train games or they really love hex encounter games or they really love Ameritrash miniatures games or Euro games. And they get really involved in, you know, their huge Euro game fan. They go to Essen if, uh, you know, they're a big GMT fan. They go to the GMT conventions and they and they kind of dig in themselves into a smaller subgenre and really enjoy that. And I just like, this is going to sound horribly pretentious. I just really enjoy the process of games. Like I, I enjoy figuring out games. I do enjoy learning new games and I like acquiring games and seeing the new stuff, but I, I can't keep up with, well, if I really wanted to, I could keep up with all the new games and such and invest my efforts into that. If I really wanted to, I could pick war games probably would be my preferred genre and just really focus on war games. But I get excited by the discovery process of not necessarily yeah. new games, but just new game mechanisms in the ways in which games use the mechanisms we know about in new and interesting ways and the design decisions uh, you know, that are behind the construction of the games that we play. I enjoy that discovery process. And that's what I've really gotten into in the last year. Yeah, yeah. 
I don't think that um, explains yeah. anything about what you were saying, but no, I no, it wasn't it. at all. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think spot on what you're saying. I mean, a lot of the great things have just been the conversations we've had just at the ends of game nights. You mm-hmm. know, we've had a lot of game nights, and uh, I just I really enjoyed talking about games, and that's one reason why the podcast has worked is because we realized that after we're playing these games we'd have really good conversations about them. Right. Yeah. Um, and but, that's but also why I've stuff. kept the, the podcast fairly spontaneous too, is because I think we have a good dynamic there in not mm-hmm. over planning. Plus that's just not me. I don't over plan anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So a lot of those little conversations are what uh, have been great about this year. Um, I, I think both conventions, PAX East and, and PAX uh, Unplugged kind of bookend it and, those events kind of felt like I'm serious about this board game world. One thing I'll say is that just the difference in our personalities is that I think, Mark, you enjoy the process of criticism and being thoughtful about forms of media, maybe. Mm -hmm. And that applies to movies and music and books and board games in a way that I just don't engage with normally Mm -hmm. and so i enjoy being analytical and strategic about things and mostly i enjoy playing the games and figuring them out and trying to win and trying to find a strategy and i enjoy rehashing the games but you tend to have more of a sometimes meta view of criticizing board game well i don't mean criticism in the sense of looking at something analytically from a form perspective Mm -hmm. and looking at the different parts of it and the process of board game design and the mechanics of it and the themes in a way that i generally don't interact with media just at that level and i mostly watch movies to enjoy them and you will also watch movies to criticize how they do a film style or something and you enjoy knowing those things and looking for them and analyzing them and talking about them and you and matt do that a lot more than i do i think yeah yeah well i mean that's how i enjoy it it's the same thing with like you know, learning more about like food and beer and wine is that I enjoy the thing. And then I think, well, there's obviously, you know, there are experts in this and there's like schools of thought and whatever. And so I'll research into the topic and find out what are these different flavors I'm tasting in the beer and what do they come from, you know, in the beer making process and what are the different styles of beer. And I enjoy that process of learning the subject and then taking that knowledge and applying it when I, you know, drink more beer in the future. And it's the same thing with movies and everything. And, and when you say analyzing the form, I think that's that's certainly what I do. You know, I try to be critical about these types of media. But in criticism, there's lots of different schools of criticism. I'm really more of a formalist than anything else in any of these endeavors. So I try to learn from other types of criticism and see their perspective but i really do enjoy kind of the formalist picking apart the mechanisms of the game or the way in which the camera is positioned and moved in the movies and things like that in figuring out what i can learn from them and how they how they impact you know the psychology of the people watching or playing them and i think i'm much more the engineer and the planner yeah. And I like knowing how it works and does it work. And you probably care more about why it works than I do. Yes. Which is probably why you were a philosophy major and Matt was a physics major and I was an engineer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in terms Plug of. Plug in how your favorite engineer joke. Mark's here. described <laughs> the way that I. Yeah. The, Mark's, Mark described how I approach the things I like. And. Sometimes it doesn't even matter what the subject is. That's why I'm into movies now, because, Mark, you were into movies, and 
you know, I could learn from you because I knew nothing about movies. And now I enjoy that media. So, I mean, movies are fun, but, you know, the, the thing doesn't necessarily even matter as much as enjoying the, the, the deconstruction of it and, and why. Yeah. Anyway, anything else from, from 2017? You guys want I think to a couple of the things I have are going to show up on the the top, top five games. list. So, well, let's let's go to that then. My top five favorite games of 2017 that were actually released in 2017. Again, I'm not a collector. I am not caught up on lots of games. There are dozens of games that I don't have that I'm sure would vibe for a spot on this list. But of the I don't know, 10 to 15 games, 2017 releases I played. These are my five favorites. Number five is Colonial Twilight, the first two-person coin game that we need to play again because we've only played it once, but it was a very enjoyable game. I, I felt safe putting it up here in the number five spot because I know I enjoy coin games, but we got to play it more and uh, kind of dig deep into what makes this unique. What I will comment on is that, you know, it is the first two-player coin game, and part of the what makes coin games great is how they did the turn order and action selection kind of thing. And then the solution they found to translate that into two players just works perfectly. It's really good. Yeah, I'm a little surprised that this showed up just looking at your top five. As a review, the whole list, I, it makes sense given the 2017 releases that we got to play. Because we've only played it one time, but I will definitely second the turn order mechanism of making it a circle and almost... This is goes back to just coin games in general, but it's sometimes more important what you let the other person do than what you do for yourself, which is just... It's such a different, interesting dynamic and kind of counterintuitive to how you might normally approach a strategy game. And in this one in particular, I felt like that was even more important than, than the other coin games we've played. Yeah, and I think you, in our one play, which I think was our first on-stream play of a board game. It might have been, yeah. But you definitely let me take the full op and special way too many times. Yeah, yeah. And it gave me so much economy that I was able to just flood the map and take over everything. Yeah, definitely. Number four of my top five games of 2017 is Harvest, which I talked about earlier. The little wow, little uh, worker placement game. It's just fun. Like it doesn't it doesn't do anything super innovative or mind blowing or crazy fascinating, but it does worker placement well. It does engine building pretty well. It does the whole grow your farm thing and get more resources and production well in only like a 30 minute game and it even fits in a little small box like we don't have that kind of thing in our collection very much like a 30 to 40 minute short euro game other than like roll for the galaxy maybe and this one it just does everything it needs to do pretty well and it has those those really cool character special powers uh, that that really focus you on different strategies and kind of push you and nudge you into different styles of playing the game. And it looks like there's a lot of different strategies that are viable in the game also. So just really solidly built. Yeah, again, I'm kind of surprised that this made the top five just because it is kind of so small and there's nothing outstanding about it from one play. I think the promising aspects are that there are more action cards that we didn't get to. So each mm -hmm. game will be different in which actions show up. Yeah, that's the thing I didn't mention is there's a lot of variability in in what action cards show up, what, what different powers people have. And, and which special characters you get. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, hey, you get well, to I'm... collect poop and use it to plant stuff and then... Yeah, there's little wooden poop tokens. Yeah. What's what, what could be bad about? Do they that? look like the poop emoji? Yes. Yes. They do wow. actually. I, think... I did. I didn't make that connection before, but they really do. Compared to the other game we've played, where I mean, we manage the... poop. This is probably a bit better. Oh, dungeon pets. <laughs> dungeon pets. Oh yeah, yeah. I would need to play dungeon pets more, but probably. 
Dungeon Pets was weird. It was funky. It was like that Vlada kind of weird, fun, zany combination of things. Yeah. But based on I, first impressions, I yeah, like um, this one better. I am really excited to play this because it sounds like you really liked it and it sounds like it's right up my alley. I think you would like it, yeah. Although it does have that thing where the game like ends right when you've built up. <laughs> yeah, it ends yeah. right after your first like solid round of things. Yeah. You do like an initial kind of cycle or two and then you have resources to do one like good action to get the the point scoring stuff and then it's over yeah because you only get connections but i think that works better in like a 30 minute game than it does in an hour long game if the game's a good game and if it's a a quick game that kind of engine ending too soon thing isn't as big a deal for me i think uh rule for the galaxy is a good example of that it's it's quick enough that it doesn't feel as bad when your engine doesn't get to play out as far. Yeah, and I this think, one's a similar length, I think. I think we mentioned this with Above and Below as well, as it, it kind of ends, it feels like it ends maybe around too soon. Well, Although with Above and Below, more, as we've gotten better at it, it doesn't feel like that to me yeah. anymore. It yeah. feels like it ends right when it needs to. Mm-hmm. So I, I expect it might be the same kind of thing with Harvest. Number three which we've already mentioned before is the most innovative game of 2017 is fog of love, which I both really enjoy, but maybe even more so I appreciate it because it's such a great design and it's trying to do something that you do not see in board games and it succeeds really, really well. And it's something yeah. that the designer mentioned when we talked to him at PAX is that every board game is about external conflict and he wanted to make a game about internal conflict. And it's a, it's remarkable how well he's able to pull that off. You yeah. do need to get kind of into the mood to play it or you have to get into a framework mentally to play it. And... Well, there's kind of a role-playing element of it. Depending yeah, you on gotta you... get into the role-playing of it. Even with that, it does an extremely good job of drawing you into it. Yes. Just, Just the design of the game beautiful. puts you in that place that you need to be to uh, enjoy the game and experience it, right? Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't put this in our other random awards. Most beautiful game of 2017 is also fog of love no doubt it it looks so good yeah 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 that near first and far would be we second saw place. The, the tables set up at pax unplugged with the the, the beautiful white pink and blue boards it, it was excellent first impression and yeah the has a, the production quality here is is just spot on with the wooden tokens the yeah. the large tarot size cards the player board, everything just aesthetically works together really well. Mark, I don't know if I told you this. I, I, I played with Amber. I played this with her. She loved it. And it, it drew her into the role playing thing. And she has said time and time again, that is one thing she will never do. Is um, role play? You know? Yeah. Like she got to the point where she was okay that I role play. Huh. But she, she just doesn't, can never see herself doing that. Uh, but she even said that she she felt herself slipping into it and and she enjoyed the challenge of, you know, being the character that her traits made up rather than her, her trait cards, rather than, you know, playing it as she would. And when I was a jerk to her, she she, you know, was figuring out that my character was a jerk and she enjoyed it. So that was awesome to see her uh, be drawn into just a little bit of role playing. <laughs> yeah, no, it, the game is so good at that. And it's a game that really tackles adult things. Like it, it's about adult relationships and not in a dirty way, just in a, like an emotionally mature way, which you don't see outside of probably some role playing games, but you know, I think the game really sells itself short when it kind of subtitles itself as like a game or like romantic comedy, the board game. 
to me, like it's funny in parts, but it's it's more emotionally deep than that. Like it really is about human psychology and human relationships in a very intelligent way. Yeah, I, I agree. So one thing I'm curious about, I haven't played any of the extra scenarios. There's a fourth pile for for scenes that are scenario scenes and i mm-hmm. haven't even touched those i've basically only played the tutorial and already had some really like profound moments oh yeah <laughs> so you know those those scenes i uh, it's almost like they'll give a framework for a story mm-hmm. is what they'll do and some of them sound really out there some of them sound really serious some of them are just, um, you know, real life things, but I can't imagine that they wouldn't work based on how the game is constructed. So, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, I've I've played the first two a lot of, scenarios. I need to play the last two, which I'm hoping to get to this week or next. There's a lot of games I'm hoping to get to, but I think we will get to them because that one I want to finish. I want to finish all four scenarios with Amber. Yeah, because it's it's either a game that's going to work incredibly well playing with your significant other or potentially very poorly but (laughs) i think if it ends very poorly you may have other issues not to make it overly serious but you've mentioned that you could and i think have learned something about the other person by playing this game with them Mm -hmm. right yeah well because you're at the same time you're playing this character that is constructed for you but you're also playing you're also you playing that character and it works on both levels of yeah, yeah. role playing but also like real life interaction and relationship and knowledge of the other person seeps in there and that doesn't harm the game mm-hmm. yeah i can see where very very good real world conversations would naturally follow after playing this game. Mm-hmm. We should we should again make clear it's also a very good game, and it's um, also occasionally really funny. Oh yeah, yeah. Both games I played had various moments. Yeah, I know Matt. You and Bubba played it at PAX, and you were laughing at the strange looks you were getting at the people next to you, hearing the. No. No, get this. I wasn't even aware of the strange oh, really? look we were getting. We were just laughing at how crazy the, the, the situation we were in was. What a game. I mean, it, it may it may rise in my estimation, but I need to I need to play the other two scenarios. But at the very least, it's the game I've probably most I haven't looked at a design and appreciated it as much since I played twilight struggle probably in terms of how clever and innovative and spot on thematically the creation of it was it probably won't reach that level in how much i enjoy playing it because you do need to kind of go into it playing up the theme a bit you know yourself and the mechanisms of the game could fall apart if you don't do that a bit and it's a much lighter game, but from kind of a, a detached standpoint, it's it's really, really good. Another candidate for a full podcast at some point, I think. Yeah, I think I want to do one once we finish, once I finish all four scenarios, slash get other people to play it also. My second favorite game coming out in 2017 is Downforce, which took us all completely by surprise because we just grabbed it when we had about an hour l- hour and a half left at PAX before Amber was going to come pick us up. And so I looked around, I'm like, well, I heard this game is fun and I know it takes less than an hour. And it was brilliant. Like just pure fun in a box, easy, simple, you know, the kind of thing, like when you first, you know, back in the early days of, of when you're a board gamer and you first play like ticket to ride and you're like, Whoa, there's so much game here and such an easy rule set. That's kind of how Downforce was for me. Yeah, it was a complete whim that you just brought this game over and I was like, what is this weirdly colorful box that you set down on the table? <laughs> we, I think we had just played um, Keyflower, which is... Yeah, and our brains had oh, melted a bit. <laughs> yeah, our, our brains had kind of melted and the color scheme is kind of this slightly drab... Uh, everything is toned down and then you get this bright, colorful Downforce box and we're like... 
sure, we've got 45 minutes to play a game. Why not? And it was great. You just, you race cars and I, what was I, the green car? But the green car was, or no, the yellow car. The yellow car was fast that day. It made it all the way around the track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a game about racing cars and screwing over everyone else. And also having, I've discovered, a sidecar that you, you secretly help along and then bet on. That's, that's my new strategy, yes. is, is, only, is only to take possession of one car, but have another car you're secretly helping. A secret sidecar. S- and so side the car. owner of that car pushes in three cars ahead of it, and your bets are screwed up. Well, it's sitting at the finish line? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh, that was horrible. Yeah, read my review. It's This game is great. It's super it's great. simple. Anyone can play. Great for parties. Like, yeah. You know, plays, plays up to six players. What? 30, 30 to 40 Wait. minutes. Yeah. I, I Although it that never place. happened at our birthday party. Yeah, we I tried to wrangle we tried, people in. But people were too busy eating and talking and not sitting around a game table playing racing cars. People with needed us. to be told what they wanted to do. I don't think you were assertive enough. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've never been assertive <laughs> enough for that. But they did just the other day announce the first expansion for Downforce. Apparently it will no be... No way! I think it's going to be just a map expansion. They said two maps and more ability cards. So I I think it's going to be in the Ticket to Ride Power Grid vein of expansions where it's cheap and it's just like shrink-wrapped map board. I'm hoping that's awesome. That way they I cut mean, down on costs. More race tracks would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. I just want more tracks. We could have uh... a Grand Prix where we do like a, a four map tour. I know that's what they need. They need to have more cards or like institute a rule where you once you run out of cards, you reshuffle the deck and have maps that connect to each other in like a mega race. That'd be great. Whoa. Well, you could Whoa. set it up where it's uh, stages of a big race, and so your finishing in the first race determines starting position in the next race, right? Oh yeah, you could do a campaign thing like that, or you could you could you could create some kind of pit stop mechanism and throw that in there. You have to make a pit stop, and you go around like twice, or it's like a huge track. I don't know. There's so many possibilities to expand this game because <laughs> the base system is so elegant and just delightful it's so sleek and tightly knit and there's just there's nothing to knit like everything we're saying is you could make it bigger or you could add this but there's no like this part sucks you know yeah there's no there's nothing bad about it it's perfectly fine as it is i want more just because it's so fun and i want more of it Mm -hmm. yeah yeah you you went we played it once and you went and bought it on the spot and we've probably played it more than anything else since PAX. Yeah, I think... Be- because it's so short, but yeah, also, yeah. we've brought it to the table more than anything else. And yeah, I think I just made variety. everyone who's come to yeah. the house play it. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And number okay. one, my favorite 2017 game... I, I, I was going to do a drum roll, but there's really... There's no suspense here. It's Gloomhaven. This is what... It, <laughs> that's what Post is for, Mark. Add a little drum roll sound effect. Yeah, I mean, if if people have been paying attention to anything I've been doing the last couple of months, it's they know it's Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven, Gloomhaven. what? <gasps> We're all shocked. I mean, when I backed this on Kickstarter and I knew it was coming, and I saw it was jumping up in the rankings, it has it hit number one yet? <laughs> I think it's at. I, I know what it hit number two, and it was creeping up on number one. I want to like every game I play, and I, I think it's very important to have that level of, of optimism when you're entering, you know, when you're playing a game for the first time. But there was a little part of me that wanted to be the contrarian voice, and I was like, man, I bet Gloomhaven is not as good as people are saying, and <laughs> it'll be really fun to kind of really dig in deep and, and tell people why it's not as good. But it, like, couldn't it's that good it's really it, it really is good currently number two with an average rating of 9.06 and it is only in second because it has 50, fewer ratings fewer, fewer yeah ratings. the thing about gloomhaven and i mentioned this in my review is that it doesn't necessarily blow my mind with like crazy new mechanisms or 
stuff I never thought was possible. Right, in the it way just, Fog of Love does, for example. Like that, or like when I played Twilight Struggle for the first time, or mm-hmm. like even when, even to the level of like Concordia, or like Castles of Burgundy, or Dominant Species, or other games where I was like, wow, this is really neat, and I never thought about a game this way before. Gloomhaven does, just takes the dungeon crawl genre and then just sets the new ground floor. Yeah. Every other dungeon crawl needs to now be better than Gloomhaven. And it does so assertively. And it's just, it just does everything right. Yeah. It, every part of the game is just done incredibly well. And there's no part of the game where you think, oh, they could have tweaked this to make it a bit better. Or this is kind of a weak part or anything like that. Like it's, it's everything's just done correctly as it should have been. Like it's the new standard for the genre. And you can't really say that in board games about other genres. Like well, maybe it, it's hard to say that in general. It's hard to <laughs> say that. High yeah. praise in general, but no, I, I mean, I wholeheartedly agree. I just, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's I mean, like the last, the, the only other game that we talk about that is like the resistance. Yeah. And, and maybe like if, Twilight if, if Imperium, what... although there's a lot of 4X games I haven't played. But yeah, The Resistance would probably be the only other one. Twilight Struggle's probably close. We talk about that as like yeah. the epitome of card-driven word games and that sort of thing. Yeah. The, the one thing that it that it does that's unlike anything else is the, the two-card top and bottom action thing. Mm-hmm. Which... I think is is so cool and 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 leads to really interesting uh, situations, but but all in all, I think you're right in that it really is just an awesome dungeon crawler, and you could replace that top bottom card thing with a different card mechanism, and it would probably still be fine. Like you say, it just it's so good in every in everything that it does. It's it's exactly what we want. Right. What excites me more about it is that going forward, people are going to have to look at Gloomhaven if they want to make that genre of game and say, how can we improve on this? So I'm looking forward to the games that upstage it. Previously, it was maybe, you know, the Fantasy Flight games. It was maybe Descent or Imperial Assault. They were like, okay, these are the dungeon crawlers. And they were good games, but they were improved upon. And this just takes a giant step forward beyond that and says, okay, here's the new ground floor for the genre. Yeah, I like the description of it as being making your dream game and not having limitations on it and just putting everything in the box. Well, in doing that in an intelligent way. And and making like a really good game doing that. Yeah. The focus is on the mechanisms and the focus is on having lots of varied content rather than making it the best looking game or the game with the coolest miniatures or the game with the most like exciting powers it focuses on the things that I would have focused on, which is the mechanisms and the scale of it, the scope of it, rather. Yeah, there's just so many extra modules that you didn't need necessarily in a dungeon crawler. Mm-hmm. You know, there's the, the I... extra encounters, and there's 17 classes, and there's a story progression, and you know, there each character retires after you complete some secret goal. And there's all these items that you, you know, unlock as you complete different quests and level up. And there's this prosperity system. And there's just, there's so much stuff. Yeah. Well, and it also recognizes, the designer recognizes that gaining new things is inherently fun and exploring new things is inherently fun. But alongside of that, he recognizes that it can't be a cheap gain it can't be something that's just thrown at you it has to both feel well earned and come at a steady rate like there are very subtle things like that 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 people might not recognize that gloomhaven does exactly right right and you have to make a choice every time you get something new yes yeah you don't just get a new power you have to choose between one of your new cards and replace an old one with it Mm mm-hmm 
Yeah, and just you only great. have so much money, so you can't buy every item, and you only have so many equipment slots, so you know you yeah. can only have so many items. So if you want to buy something new, you probably have to replace something old, mm-hmm. and you're turning down all the other items because you only have fifty gold to buy buy stuff. Uh, I was gonna say one other thing in my life. I say I am really excited about opening the new thing. I, I'm really excited about opening like a new character box. Oh yeah, me too. I recognize that it it's going to be like at least five or six game sessions away before I do that. And it doesn't bother me one bit because I want to spend all that time. Then I'll open a box and then I'll want to keep playing it. And well, and it's not um, that it's, it's that you have those kind of long-term goals, but you know, you're going to be gaining new and interesting things pretty much after each session, almost every time you're going to get something. If it's, you know, a random encounter that unlocks new story possibilities or new items or unlocks a new side scenario, or if you level up and get new card selection, or if you get enough money to buy that thing that you wanted to buy, you're getting you get a perk and you get to optimize your modifier your, your deck. modifier deck. Yeah. After almost every scenario, you're getting something. And so you have those short term gains and those new exciting things and you have kind of the medium term gains of what's going to happen with the story and what missions are going to be unlocked and then you have the long term of retiring your character opening up a new box and seeing what new bizarre classes are going to be revealed it's i'm smiling i have a huge grin on my face just just thinking about it yeah and it hits a really good balance in not giving you too much giving you enough stuff but not overwhelming to the point where money doesn't matter anymore yeah which is something i've been paying attention to a little bit recently in some other games i've played where at some point you have 80 million dollars and you can buy anything you want a hundred times over and so money just doesn't matter anymore and there's no value to it because there's no scarcity (laughs) Yeah. yeah and so they have to like invent a new currency for it to be scarce that gives you things you want so you have an incentive to play and earn it or accumulate it until it you know scales off the charts again and that's a really hard thing to do in a scaling game and so far gloomhaven is nailing it yeah and glue it's it's as good as you've heard like yep. it's like it may be my favorite game ever like i'm not gonna really think about it until whenever the one year anniversary of when we did our first top 50 list so I, I plan on doing one every year, so like next April. But it's going to be in the running for the number one spot, I think. It, it, it's that good to me. I, I, I just want to keep playing it more and more. I don't want to set it up or take it o- or, or pack it up, but I do want to play that's it. Why, that's why you get a second apartment to just have it set up. <laughs> I believe that's the, the strategy that I, I read is, is best. Or just have a, a, its own room. You just have the Gloomhaven room in your yeah, house. Instead yeah. of a study, you just have the Gloomhaven room. Yeah, it's it's a perfect solution. As you retire characters, they go up on the wall in like a little frame shrine. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Oh, man. Anyway, those are my favorite games of 2017. Did, were there any that you guys wanted to add? Oh, man, it's a good list. I can put TI4 on my list because I did get to play it. At PAX. That's true. Yeah, it would be on your list. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Dominion Nocturne because I hope they never stop making Dominions. And it was <laughs> it's a good experience. It was better than I expected. So being a Dominion better than I expected, it's one of the best games of the year. I mean, it's an expansion. I wasn't I wasn't counting those. Oh, uh, that's fair. That's fair. But I guess you can count it. It's kind of a standalone game, though. The way that Dominion works yeah it's like a whole new set of cards it's a big expansion right it's like 500 cards again or something it is it's a standard big one it's not ginormous yeah okay question are the vampire and necromancer cards as cool as i maybe hope they are the necromancer is 
a little underwhelming to me, but the vampire, which turns into a bat and then back into vampire, is amazing. What? That sounds awesome. Yeah. Oh, thematically, it's like all the little good things about theme in Dominion, except maybe as good as it's ever been done. That's great. I'm I'm loving the thematic aspects of Dominion more and more as I as I play it online. Yeah, it's like you have to already love Dominion to appreciate the thematic elements. But they're so fun. Yeah, yeah. What a year, guys. What a year. It's what been a, a year. fantastic year. I'm excited about where the Thoughtful Gamer is going in 2018. Hopefully more video stuff. I'm working on refamiliarizing myself with video editing. I have lots of cool stuff planned tentatively. I think we have some cool podcasts we can do. Obviously lots of fun games to play. But I think I'm going to try to hold off on new games for a while. Legitimately this time. I, I think you say that every week, Mark. I'm only saying it to reinforce it in my mind, Orion. Okay. Because there are so many games here I really want to play that we haven't played yet. And at some yep. point I'll release a new top five or maybe a top ten of 2017 once I have played most more of these 2017 games. Because most of those games we haven't played, yeah, I think the majority are 2017 releases. So mm-hmm. there may be some that sneak up there. Yeah, looking at your list... A lot of the ones I would have considered as contenders were in the category of have yet to be played. Yeah, same here. Like I think War of the Ring could be easily up there. Ti four, Hunt for the well, Ring. Probably or sorry, yeah, Hunt for the Ring. Yep. Spirit Island, Expanse. Yeah. Four X. Four X. Yeah, that's it. That, yeah, it's a twenty seventeen. Okay. The, the other one from Holland Spiel is not. Four X could be. We'll see. <laughs> That um, might be much higher in your rankings than ours, but we'll see. We'll see. I'm excited. But anyway, let us know what your favorite games of 2017 were. If there are any that we missed that we must need to play, maybe don't mention those so I don't get tempted and buy them. Or maybe pressure, you know, Guilt, Matt, or Orion to buy them. But that's the <laughs> podcast for today. It's been a great year. I can't wait till 2018. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes so we can get our 10th rating. We only have nine, and that's a disappointing number. Check out thethoughtfulgamer.com to see the reviews and everything else I write and post on the website. Hit me up on Twitter and Facebook, and you can talk to me there or ask me questions or tell me what games I'm missing from 2017. And if you'd like to watch these podcasts live and talk with us as we talk with each other and get all kinds of other cool rewards head over to patreon slash the thoughtful gamer just a couple dollars a month will get you access to all kinds of cool stuff plus it will help me not lose money on the thoughtful gamer in 2018 thank you to everyone for supporting and listening to the podcast and following the blog it's been a great year we hope you've enjoyed everything we've put out and uh looking forward to an even better 2018 yeah yeah i i completely agree it's been great i've gotten lots of positive feedback people seem to enjoy what we've been talking and writing about so that that feels awesome thank you very much we'll talk to you again in a couple of weeks goodbye everyone Bye.